We're really good at science, but we drop out. We get to those kind of early postdoc years, and uh, the number of women, the percentage of scientists out there for women drop down. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the media recently about what the cause of this might be. Um, some of them are family commitments, um, work-life balance, reassessments, um, the possibility that working in this sort of natural environment isn't very attractive to women. But these are not the things that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, we're going to be discussing how we can retain <coughs> those women in science and the possible, possible ways in which that can be helped through um, the discussions that go on today. Because, yeah, we live in a new world, uh, the world of uh, Skype, of Twitter, uh, of blogs, of uh, all those um, online tools that can really help you uh, be more flexible, work from home, and that could actually help uh, leverage some of the constraints and some of the, some of the, the costs that uh, certain people, including a lot of women in science, are experiencing. So um, the idea today is to discuss how online activity can help women in science. Um, Sarian will uh, chair all uh, the panel and the discussion. I'll be going um, in the audience, uh, trying to follow online and here. If you have any comments or any question, uh, just raise your hand or use the hashtag solo one two women in science. And uh, the idea is really to get a maximum participation from you. Okay, so we have a panel of three today. Um, we have uh, Judith Willits, um, Athena Donald, and a lot uh, uh, <laughs> um, And unfortunately, uh, we met have Martin Robbins, but I believe that he is in bed with uh, possibly man flu. <laughs> 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 oh. uh, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to let the, um, before I move any more, uh, I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves, tell you a bit about what their background is and what their involvement is on online so far in science. Oh, hello. Um, I'm Judith Willits, and I'm the chief executive of the British Society for Immunology. Um, I'm not a scientist, and up until this year, wasn't really um, an adopter or even an adapter of what I call Web2 technologies. I'm here as your kind of token Luddite, I think. Um, what I was interested in was the, about the, the number of people that we have attending conferences, looking at the balance of, you know, female speakers. We know, as, as um, we've heard, that we have loads and loads of women entering science, but quite a lot drop out at a certain time. And although that's not the main thrust of today, that did get me to starting to kind of look at how people do use Web2 technologies. And I actually read quite a lot of research, which I recommend you look at from the research, um, what's it called? Research Information Network, and they also have a very good blog, so that might be a good thing to look at. I started looking at how blogging has actually impacted on things like scientific controversies. So I was looking at the, um, the climate gate controversy, and that was a thing where, where actually it was, it was really through the use of blogs that the, the debate kind of went out there, and people actually kind of owned that debate and influenced that debate and then I started looking about uh, at how many guys use blogs and started looking at perceptions related to that. The blog I put up for, for this was actually about the perceptions of women in science through the news media um, and that's something that I am particularly interested in because I'm interested in the background that's been hinted at earlier on, the background influences, the sociological influences that might make it hard for people to engage, might make it hard for people to feel confident about blogging or, t or tweeting. Um, and I think we'll talk a bit more um, about that in detail later on, so I'll, I'll shut up for now. Okay, I'm Athena Donald and I'm a professor of physics at the University of Cambridge. <laughs> I started blogging just over two years ago um, and tweeting shortly after that. And when I started my blog, I was very aware of the fact that as a, a rather rare thing, a female physicist, um, I wanted to write about experiences that could be attributable, if you like. So I blog completely openly under my own name. That was a very conscious decision. I know it's an issue for many women as to whether they write um, under their own names or not. Um, but I felt it gave much more power to what I said. I don't only blog about women in science issues, and, and that again is a very deliberate decision. I want to uh, 
make sure that I get lots of male readers too, so that when I do write about an issue about women in science, they're still reading. Um, so I write about life as a scientist more generally. Um, I use Twitter largely to um, access links and to disseminate links, a lot of which again will be around women in science issues, but by no means all. Um, I should say I am involved in a lot of um, activities which seem to be moving, if you like, more towards an online presence. For instance, one of the things I'm on the uh, Royal Society of Quality and Diversity Advisory Network, um, and they are thinking of starting up a blog. I've been trying to push the Royal Society to do more blogging. I should say I'm a fellow of the Royal Society, so I can keep pushing. Um, and I think it's certainly something that's changing. But having said that, in my own department, I certainly don't know anyone else who blogs and precious few people who tweet. Um, I'm Alok Char, I'm not a woman, um, and um, I think I'm a token man on this panel. Uh, and uh, I'm a journalist at Guardian newspaper, I write about science and health and environment, and mainly news and features. Um, my online presence, I suppose, is mediated through that really, all, all my articles are online, and I use Twitter for, as Dini said, to mainly find links and occasionally have arguments with people. Um, but. Um, uh, what, what I, I suppose I, I have done also is, that's more relevant to, to this audience is I helped set up the Guardian Science Blogs Network uh, with my colleagues on the paper. This is an idea to try and get more experts of all types writing about science on our platform and integrated into the wider news coverage that we're doing. So this is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a sort of collective of, of blogs. I think it's about 10 now. And they are writing everything from life as a scientist, to, um, to dinosaurs, to space, and, um, and those, those sorts of issues. Uh, Martin, who was meant to be here, is one of those bloggers as well. Feeney writes for us. Um, there's, the idea is that those blogs are completely independent, and the writers publish by themselves uh, onto our platform. And we are trying our best to integrate more of that coverage, blogging coverage, into the rest of the newspaper, distribute it through other parts of the website, keep it to be uh, very uh, highly relevant. And actually, it's been very successful so far. With the, the launch, relaunched blogging network um, in around two months or so now, and has done really, really well. And we're hoping that we can expand a bit more as well. Great, thanks a lot. So I guess the main question that you're burning to ask our panelists are, can online actually help women in science at all? Um, so what are the costs and benefits, and um, why is visibility online important? So perhaps I can um, direct this first question to kick, kick off this idea with, uh, to Athene. So can online actually help women in science promote their profile? I, I've alluded to one issue that a lot of women are anxious about, and that is that if they go out there as a woman, that they are then more easily targeted. Um, so if you want to raise your profile, you obviously can't blog anonymously. And so that, that is one tension that I suspect men don't suffer from as much. I think online can help in many ways. Um, one is, I believe, blogging helps writing skills. Um, I think it's helped mine, just sort of honing the, the prose you use, but it's also the fact that very often um, as students, as postdocs, you actually don't get that much opportunity to write. Um, and you're often very constrained, and it's a very different style of writing. So I think there are um, positives just from the very act of doing it, quite apart from the fact that if you start blogging, you do become visible after a while, and that is more likely to um, enable you to get invitations to speak. Um, I don't just mean it in sort of occasions like this, but at conferences, if you're blogging about your actual research and the way you're tackling it and things, it, it raises your profile in, I was going to say a passive way. One of the things that um, in my own university, we've been doing some consultations with women, nothing to do with science, nothing to do with online. But one of the things that they said was that they did not like self-promoting. And if self-promoting in the sense of going up and asking um, some senior professor, I want to have a talk at a conference or something. But if you put yourself out there under your own terms, writing what you want to say, you are not actually putting your hand up and saying, please, sir, can I have something? You are just making yourself visible um, in a way that could also be beneficial. So I think online certainly can help 
but it has to be recognised that some women have had very bad experiences. Um, I'm glad to say, well, the only time I felt I had a bad experience actually was when I wrote for Comment is Free in The Guardian about macho culture. <laughs> and I, have to, I don't normally read the comments, but I felt obliged to that time, and I rather regretted it and for a few of them. Um, but that's I mean, and they weren't even then particularly personal. There was the one who thought I was a man. There was the one who thought I should go and spend some time with scientists because I obviously didn't know anything about it and I wasn't a very good journalist. But leaving that aside, um, I think there is a lot that going online can do for you. So you've highlighted some of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the bad things about blogging there as well as the good things. Um, what about other forms of um, online activity? I think also it's, I think the, the, it's an opportunity to to set up um, the, the kind of collaborative groups and that's where a lot of the success has come because you can you know find like-minded people you can say what you're interested in in doing and from the research I've read that's been some of the most kind of successful outcomes from it has been sort of finding and, and developing your own new mini networks which has been fantastic for collaborative research because obviously it, it's it's all over the world it doesn't particularly matter where you are and I think you've almost got to kind of suck it and see and start doing some of this stuff and seeing, you know, seeing what happens. I know some universities do have um, kind of rules about whether you can blog or not, and I don't know to what extent people have found that problematic. The other thing I think is kind of interesting is on the, we spend quite a lot of time talking about sort of public engagement and citizen science. We also talk about ways of kind of enabling people to talk about what, what's important in research, what research should be funded. And I know that's kind of a big Pandora's box, but I think the idea of putting out there, as Athene said, what, what you're interested in doing, what you would like to do if you could, might be a slightly more subtle way of introducing your own areas of interest, whether you've got a grant to, to follow that, that research or not. And I think that's, that's quite an interesting area to look at as well. I have an interesting question for you from Twitter, actually. Uh, it's Karen that asks uh, if um, if women more than men are more at risk of being taken less seriously as a scientist, they have a high online presence. What do you think? Would that be a risk? I don't think that is the case. No, I, I think. think that was sorry. Do you no, go ahead. I mean, I think. I think there's something here about redressing the balance, but there's also a kind of inherent way that perhaps men and women have behaved differently in the past, and I appreciate that's a, that's a difficult area. Whether women feel less a sense of entitlement, whether they're more sensitive to having what they've said, you know, rubbished or, 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 or questioned. Um, I, I mean, I think you, you said something about that and about bad experiences. I don't know whether guys just don't worry so much about that. So I think we've got to redress the balance. We've got, you know, most of the coverage about science in the news media will feature men. And women journalists are particularly guilty of trivializing the reportage of women scientists. You know, we grumble about the fact that people spend more time talking about one's appearance and your perhaps domestic situation than your professional life and your research. And actually, most of the, the people who do that tend, tend to be women rather than men. It might be a bit more extreme from the male journalists talking about Susan Greenfield's dominatrix heels as she works the room. But, but you know, women are like kind of you know guilty of this too. So you've got to get out there. You've got to redress the balance. You've got to almost flood the world with more and more blogs and tweets from women, so that gradually that presence becomes greater. And what will filter out of that is the really excellent stuff and the general stuff, and maybe the not so good stuff. I think I think people have got to be brave and take risks. But as I say, you can write on your own terms, which is an advantage. Um, whereas if you are being interviewed by you know, mm. someone who sticks a microphone under your face and, and starts trivialising what you're doing, it's actually much harder to deal with that. I think where women have a potential problem is you know, on blogs is the same as absolutely everywhere, this sort of unconscious bias. Many of you will have read the recent <coughs> PNAS paper about unconscious bias on CVs, that, mm. that women may be taken less seriously by men and women without the people realising they're doing it. And that may apply to blogs too, but mm. that's no different from the rest of the world. It's nothing to do with blogging. So, um, 
So, I mean, what do you think about this? How does, as a journalist, what do you, do you, look, uh, if you're looking for scientists to write about their work or what they're doing, do you, does their online profile influence how, how you choose and who you choose? But for me, uh, it's who I speak to for a story is essentially depending on whether they're available mm. in the time I need them to be available, um, which is quite simplistic, I admit, but um, there are pressures around the daily newspaper journalism. Or, or unfortunately, um, when it comes to um, features and things where you have a bit more time, then I'm not. I don't think I'm particularly. Um, I don't go out to find women particularly to speak to. I have to say, uh, but I will speak to a lot of people and rec get them to recommend colleagues in, the, in that field who I should speak to for comments or for more context. And often, more often than not, they are women uh, and. It's kind of, it doesn't really enter my radar, I suppose. When it does, I really do think about it very hard, is the, uh, the commissioning side of things. And um, it's not that I think that we must have lots more women writing for us. I just think that we are very lazy sometimes in just going for people we know. And they just happen to be historically more men than women. who will come forward or we'll, we'll do something if you ask them to in, in, in the course of two days or something, which is sometimes what we need. But I tell you what, I'm getting much, many, many more, more pictures from women scientists nowadays, and it makes my life much easier. And um, when it comes to blogging networks, um, they, they run themselves, but um, we do have a problem there where when we asked, when we put out a call earlier this year, do you want to be part of this network? We had um, a lot of, um, we, we didn't have a lot of, let's say a third were, were women in terms of the people who wanted to join in. We, we made a conscious effort to look at their applications much more carefully. And um, you kind of have to have that sort of almost positive bias in that respect to sort of force yourself to do that. Now, it turned out that a lot of the women who did apply um, didn't have much blogging experience themselves. And we didn't, we wanted people who were experienced. So maybe the next phase of this, which is what I alluded to earlier, which Martin could have talked about as well, is that we wanted to try and encourage those people who've never done it before and sort of to, 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 to get their hand in, to get better at it, so then we can leave run free on the website, it's a bit difficult to do that on a big platform like ours without being aware of sometimes how awful the responses can be, how to deal with that. It's, it's, it would be irresponsible of us to, to do that. So we're, we're, we're consciously trying to do that much more on the, on the where, where we can control it. But on the news and feature side, I'm afraid, it, it really is dependent on who's available and who's written the paper and all those things. Um, feel free to ask questions, by the way, audience, this is for you. <laughs> Can I just say something? I think it's really important to get help. I'm somebody who desperately, desperately needs help in so many ways. But it's just that thing, I don't know whether you guys think it's important to get some help and training in terms of, you know, how to blog and how to use these things. Because I, I, I actually think that's quite important. If someone sort of holds your hand a bit and shows you how to do things, it starts becoming the norm. And I like what you said about it can slightly hone and change your writing skills as well. And I think that's really important. There's stuff now about how you can you know, get your message across in the length of a tweet. And that's a great skill to have. You know, doing something maybe, maybe more than just, just presenting links to people, but trying to get some kind of concept and idea over in very few words is great. But I certainly really needed help with this. It felt like an enormous world that I was excluded from, that I wouldn't know how to do it, and I found it quite scary. So I do think that having somebody to help you with it, whether it's your colleagues or, or whoever, is really important. <laughs> I think following on from that point, I was wondering whether um, Alok said that your blogs, you just, you host them, but you don't, you, know, you don't edit them, or you don't, the person just puts their blog post up. So if um, women scientists do feel like they need more help or they're not sort of ready to do that, maybe that's not the best way to do it. Maybe you should, I know you have limited resources, but maybe you should create it a bit more, like edit it or help them, rather than just saying, here's your blog, put up what you want, and we'll sort of hand you over to the, the commenters. Well, uh, the, the, the blogs themselves that are run by like that are only handed over to people who are very experienced in doing that and want to do that. Um, it's not that we would give that. that that's that's sort of so I'm kind of I'll come to the New York just said. So that, that they are kind of people who already do that and kind of are happy with that. 
Um, the new ones, yeah, absolutely. This is what I'm saying. The next phase of things is to try those people out and encourage them to be edited and work in that situation. And at some point, if they retake really to it, they say, well, well you, you can have your own one. Um, it's problematic for us to edit everything because we just don't have the time, unfortunately. There's no person there that edits all that stuff. Having said that, on our, our main blog, the, um, the science blog we run ourselves um, internally, um, that's when we do edit and we carry and solicit articles uh, from people. And we do that exact same thing that you're talking about, where you get lots of men and women, actually. Um, but I, I, I would, I don't know what the data on this is, but um, I think that on our main blog, apart from me and Ian, who write there occasionally, I would say it's, it, it's quite, the, 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 the proportion of men and women writing there are quite equitable. And they're all edited, they're all um, you know, brought in from outside, and they're not running it themselves and stuff and all those sorts of things. And so those are some of the people that regularly start to write for us and maybe could have a blog in the future ourselves. And I certainly think that Martin, where he is, is your job, if you're listening to this, is to find more women and take that risk and develop that side of things. We definitely want to do that. If, and part of his new thing is to try and is to try and encourage those people to come forward. Or if not, then drag them forward and force them to do it somehow. And, and that's how we're trying to, to address this issue. I think there is the sheer practicality of how to start a blog. I know, sort of having got it in the back of my mind, that maybe I wanted to do it. I had no idea you know, how you set up a blog, how you got an address, how you configured it or anything. And I mentioned it to a computer officer in my department who just said, well, you should read the WordPress how to start a blog site. And I spent the weekend reading this. And on Monday morning, he said to me, and that was on Friday, on Monday morning, he said, well, did you start it? And I thought, what touching faith. I could say, <laughs> yes, I have. And I mean, and certainly I find WordPress brilliant in just taking me through the mechanics of how to do it. Um, that's nothing to do with editing what you actually write, but it's just how you, how you set it up, how you put links into text, all that kind of stuff. Um, certainly wasn't part of my education. Mm. Uh, one thing that we had uh, through our blogs is um, to try to discuss why we wouldn't be less uh, present on online because we have a lot of, um, of people that do blog for us but also interact with Twitter. <coughs> mentioned the um, imposter syndrome. So what do you... Have you ever felt the imposter syndrome? How you I feel like an imposter sitting here. <laughs> what, what about you, Do you, do um, you think it plays a role? That, is it correlated somehow with the stage in your career? Do you, do you feel more confidence once you are reach a certain level? And I, well, I think, I think personally, personally I haven't experienced the imposter syndrome to the extent that, that women who, whose blogs I've read have. But I can understand that because, you know, I'm a lot older and they are research scientists. For them, for them, they're trying to do something different. They're trying to use a different medium to get themselves out there. And I think they face issues in their career that personally I haven't. So I'm sympathizing and empathizing with something that I haven't experienced personally. What I do experience personally within science constantly on the sort of committees and meetings I attend is inherent sexism everywhere. And I could, you know, bore for the UK and Europe and the world on, on the subject because that is rife and I do think that that's relevant because I think it's the backdrop against which a, a lot of us work and it is very, very present, you know, so. I, I think it, it's fair to say that when I blogged about imposter syndrome earlier this year, an awful lot of men said they suffer from it too. I think we have to be a bit careful mm. about this. I think it's that women are more likely to speak about it, but uh, and maybe they act on it and, and getting it out in the open and saying, yes, it is absolutely ubiquitous, I think it should be helpful. Mm. Can I just add one thing, but sorry, just to say, one issue is we're getting more women in science to write about it, science, uh, for us, definitely. But also I think that women scientists should get themselves much more into the mainstream conversation. Say, for example, our women's pages, which are very successful and are very prominent um, in, in, in sort of general media conversation. I don't see many women scientists writing for them, or even men scientists writing for them, to be honest. I've encouraged them, the guys, the editors, the editors of that, to find more women scientists, but they struggle to get anyone to talk about their lives and things, maybe for the same issues. It's more important than just science blogs. Yes, and the women's are power list. I would encourage you example, to nominate well, scientists they, there because they, they, they weren't done ones. That women power, the, the, the Guardian's women pages did something similar. I know that we're doing one now. 
very important. And it, it can seem such a, such a debasing type thing to do, but actually, if you stay quiet as women scientists and don't take part, then no one will ask you to take part, unfortunately. And it always frustrates me when there aren't scientists on these top power lists of men and women. Never mind the fact that there's no women on but When there's a specific list of women in power and you've just got actresses and things who are, I'm sure, wonderful, it, it, that's a bit frustrating I too. I was on that list. So you were. <laughs> <Sorry. many people. laughs> but, but need more scientists, sorry. Hi, um, I just wanted to know what you think. It's all well and good to be talking about getting more women scientists uh, involved online, but what about before they are fully qualified scientists, getting more young people who are still in education using these tools? I found it um, very personally helpful. I blogged about my whole um, dissertation process, and I got a lot of great feedback and help from Twitter from scientists all over the world who normally probably would never read my dissertation or be interested in anything I was doing, and they were really helpful in providing comments on my blog and things like that. Do you think that's something we should also be encouraging? The PhD student, should you as supervisor help them to get on the load, just to monitor them and try to get them why not? I mean, again, it's going to help their writing skills at the very least. And, you know, it, it is a way of getting feedback of different kinds. Uh, certainly, when I talk about scientists online, I wouldn't say it couldn't be an undergraduate or graduate. I wasn't even making that distinction mentally. Hi. Um, when thinking about women and blogging, um, the thing that comes uh, most recently to mind is the really upsetting uh, article and experiences of Rebecca Watson, Skeptic. And um, I just wanted to ask the panel if they had any thoughts uh, or you know, similar experiences or ways that you might have handled that um, sort of situation uh, of discovering, I don't know if everybody's familiar with, but uh, very deep sexism in the skeptic community uh, to the point of um, she had uh, uh, somebody saying that they were, were going to sexually harass her at the next uh, place that she gave a, a speech um, and other kind of very upsetting um, yeah, episodes of sexism. Well, I, I think it's absolutely appalling, but I, I'm not sure. I don't think that's a reason for not blogging, put it that way. And I'm, how do you handle it? Well, I think she's got immense support through the community as well. Um, and I guess it's one of these instances where um, I would suspect the people who are harassing her came out of it much less well, but it doesn't make it at all an easy thing to mm. deal with. I mean, that, that's trouble. You do have to have a thick skin if you get exposed to that. And having other people support you is a really great thing, but it may not be sufficient. And it's interesting, I went and talked at um, a university recently about Athena Swan, and there was a, a female philosopher there who was saying, well, how about sexual harassment in physics? And I was saying, I don't think it's that bad these days. And she said in philosophy, and, and pointed me in the direction of a blog about philosophy, where really horrendous stories were coming in. Um, but I think having the fact that that blog exists does give both validation and support to those people who are involved in those situations. But it doesn't stop it happening. I think the quality of an online community also is something that you can affect if you moderate well. I mean, you know, you, you, if you bring someone, if you write someone who writes for your website and you don't moderate the comments or you don't watch the comments and weed out the sort of trolls and, and the uh, people who are abusing the, um, the, the writer, uh, sexually harassing them, whatever else, um, then you know that that's not a good thing. You've got you've got to have some careful managing of that community, I think, um, and then the community will police itself. If 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 it's well managed, then it will do that. Now you can't do anything about people outside your own website, of course. That's different. Um, so I think what you said is true. You have to have a bit of a thick skin. It's unfortunate you have to have a thick skin, but it, it is something that with anonymity and all sorts of other things will keep will happen. But I'm encouraged by the fact that even in Rebecca's case, Rebecca Watson's case, and also the case of the, 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 the professor who wrote something slightly sexist from the Society of Neuroscience Conference on his Facebook page a while ago, which, which by the way, which you've all laughed at, but it's, it's not a nice thing that he wrote. Um, uh, but he, he was ridiculed, and I think that's exactly the way to deal with this stuff. 
<coughs> is to have people responding in that way and sharing on Twitter. And it was just as many men as women who were sharing that. So there is positive stuff out there. And I think you have to create a goodwill as well as for when things go wrong. And when things go wrong, and hoping that, that not everyone has the same experience as Rebecca, but she's got this incredibly thick skin, so she was able to talk about it. But you know, it's a good way of saying that you know, we, there are people who will support you in this situation. And I think these networks can work together like that. And that's why I think it's really positive, because at least the examples you're talking about, I think it's just reiterating what you said, it puts it out there. So it's not it's not the thing that constantly goes on, you know, behind closed doors or in departments. The fact that it the fact that it's out there means that it's open for people to comment on. And I think it I think it does, you know, people are, will be ridiculed for that. And I think it's just, it, it kind of exposes it and it gives people the opportunity to respond to it. And I think that makes it feel a safer and more supported environment than, than the historical physical spaces that, that men and women have inhabited. Uh, it's a comment and it's one of those annoying things. I can't Google it to find it. But I think, isn't there a hashtag for calling for help against trolls? So that you're not actually alone. Um, if you're being um, bombed. Troller Derby. Kate Clancy. So perhaps somebody could um, tweet that for us all, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess we're, we've now moved on quite naturally to the question of so obviously online, having an online presence does help bring in science, it helps everyone in science. Um, but why are women not using the internet as much as men are? And, and, and this is quite a different case for science compared to the non-science world where I understand that the majority of Facebook users and Twitter users are actually women. Um, so we talked about needing a thick skin um, and that the, the need for self-policing um, on, on these online resources. But is there any, does the panel or the audience have any opinions on other reasons that might explain why women are less uh, predisposed, less keen to use the internet for their, to, to promote their scientific work or to, to promote their science profile. One possible issue, I mean, something that I'm always challenged with is how do you have time? And where women have, um, where women are carrying more than the 50% share of a family responsibilities, for instance, I'm trying to put that as neutrally as possible. They may feel that you know it's a luxury they can't afford to take time to express themselves in that way, or they may just be physically too tired if they've got tiny children and things. So I think, although to me, one of the, the advantages of blogging is I can do it at times when I'm too tired to do other things, um, that can also you know, it can still be far too demanding, and it may mean that they, they feel they ought to be doing the earning or something. I think some women have, tr have tried to address it by forming, um, forming themselves in small groups and under whatever umbrella. So rather than promoting yourself and your work individually, you, you have a sort of a small collective, and then at least you can do some, some sharing of the load and perhaps take it in turns to do something. So you're you can, you know, you you can you can blog as a group, and the group members can can take it in turns to do things. And I know in the immunology community, we're just sort of looking looking at that now, how we can be supportive of women who have very specific issues that they feel that they're facing, be that with you know work life demands or coping with the, quite a sexist environment that they feel that they work in. And we're actually going to come together and look at how we can try and share some of the workload so that so people feel that, that they're being supported. I think one thing that uh, we, we touched on with uh, Kat Collins' blog and this week is also how online can help getting for monitoring, getting for being yeah. monitored, but also uh, monitoring. Uh, so a lot of the monitoring, scientific monitoring program uh, are, are suffering from the lack of people signing up and trying to help. Mm -hmm. um, if you start to use online, more, it, it could actually be a way, and that, that is possible again, and one, also one of the benefits to the community as to this worthwhile engagement. Actually, that was one, so point, one tiny data point out, which maybe isn't uh, indicative of lots of things. I, I could grab a lot of hope for. We've run a science writing prize with the Wellcome Trust, actually, uh, for the last two years. And um, more than 50% of the entrants, and shortlisted people are women in that 
young scientists um, or, or people interested in science. And last year, well, the one the year's gone, both the winners were women, and this year one of the winners was women. I mean, that's overrepresented in women, and that's only a great thing. I mean, there's no shortage of women who want to write about science and who are scientists. But I guess the question is that do those women <coughs> go on to stay in science, or are they the ones? That Certainly, I don't know. It's only last year. Uh, so <laughs> I guess I guess they do, um, but it seems like it's not in that generation or at that sort of level. It seems like there's lots of women doing these things and blogging and getting really involved. I think. But, um, but we don't know the answer to that yet, do we? Because a lot, for a lot of people have only just started doing this. So although we kind of have a sense that it might make life easier for women to be able to put their ideas out more online, we won't really know perhaps for a few years whether that has also enabled them to stay beyond kind of postdoc level, for example. So, so my question kind of relates to this comment. And I do see a big, I'm a, I'm a physicist, an astrophysicist, and I see a big dichotomy between uh, when I go to a science meeting, it's very male-dominated. Um, when I go to an outreach meeting, they tend to be uh, dominated by women. Mm. Um, and I, so I'm actually quite surprised by this discussion. I, I actually, I, from my personal experience, I'd expect more women scientists than average to be online and communicating and doing this, this kind of stuff. Um, but, but maybe this is a concern that, that they're worried that this is sort of a route out of being a scientist and they want to stay away from it to, to kept, I was a person who tweeted about them being kept seriously, <laughs> taken seriously. I do, I genuinely worry that, that scientists worry that other scientists won't take them seriously if they have too much of an online presence. I mean, I think outreach is often um, the sort of physical outreach and um, it, it, I mean, I, I can't remember if you at this morning's discussion about outreach, but um, <coughs> the, I think there is plenty of evidence that, that women are much more prone to do that. And one of the things we were discussing this morning was whether universities t give credit for outreach work. Um, my own university now does. It has it explicitly as part of its promotion criteria that, that it is one of the things that you can sort of gain credit for. Um, so that's at a slightly higher stage still. But. Um, I think there is the danger that, not that it's not taken seriously, but there's actually a difference between people doing hands-on outreach and having an online presence. And I, I think there may be more of a distinction there than you're making. The implication being that you're not a serious scientist if you've got time to spend doing all this blogging and tweeting and stuff. If you've got any free time at all, you can so I mean, one thing that um, colleagues of mine have said to me is that they don't want female colleagues, they don't want to engage in online blogging or tweeting because it's it's uncontrolled, it's not peer reviewed, and that they're, they're, they feel so much more exposed and vulnerable and it can go viral if they say something silly. Um, I mean, what's the panel's view on this? You have total control over what you put out there. Um, and if you are nervous about something, you don't have to, to put it out there. So I find, I find that a slightly strange reaction, actually. Um, it's not that you are one of several authors and one of the others may have messed up their experiment. It is yours. You, you have control. So I, I find that reaction quite strange. I think that's what they're scared about, but it hasn't been peer reviewed. It hasn't been double checked by a co author. I'll, I'll, I'll just argue on that. And, and, uh, stepping back from this, it's not just a woman, uh, an issue for women. That it's the most a lot of scientists I think this. My response to scientists who feel like they can't comment to me on a paper or um, who don't want to write things is, uh, well, life isn't peer reviewed for a start. I'm not asking <laughs> you to do science. Uh, and in fact, if you did, it'd be boring, frankly, or for what I, for my purposes. You've got to figure out what the purpose of it is. If you are just a prominent uh, female scientist. Um, and an issue in the news it interests you, then your opinion from a position of authority actually matters and is interesting. And the person who says the thing that might offend you or offend lots of other people won't stop saying those things because you haven't said what you said. And it doesn't matter, they're not peer reviewed either. Uh, I think the whole thing is like you can't see the whole world through scientific lenses, otherwise, you'd never go shopping, you wouldn't, do, uh, you wouldn't um, look after anyone, you wouldn't have normal relationships with anything. <laughs> just had to do everything you. It'd be silly. So it's all about risk taking, isn't it? No, it's not. It's about risk taking. It's about being a normal human being. <laughs> 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 
I was just going to say that whenever I'm going to write something really controversial, I do get a peer review. If I'm writing a blog that I feel might be stir things up a lot or attract a lot of trolls, I give it to some of my friends whose opinions I trust, and they read it through and give, maybe give me a few suggestions for moderating this or tweaking mm. that so it comes across more strong, you know, strongly. Cause well, <laughs> if you're doing something controversial, you want to be strong and you want to have your facts straight. So I think there's nothing wrong with running your blog past a mate. Mm -hmm. If you think they'll make you feel better about doing it. And by the way, editing is a good thing. That that's essentially what editing is. It's just like you get other people to read it and tell you where it doesn't work or where the, maybe you check these facts or whatever. Do that. If you feel like something's important, then you will put that effort into it. Yeah. So there's been a lot of talk recently about uh, women wanting to have it all and why should women want to have it all? The whole career, the family life, you know, they, women shouldn't be able to have it all. I want it all. Um, do you think the panellists and, and the audience, do you think that online can fill that gap? Do you think that online is the start to letting women like me have it all? I think start, I mean, particularly when it comes to families, is making sure your partner does their fair bit, which has nothing to do with the online present. Um, I, I think often there is always lurking in that the presumption that the woman is going to do more than their fair share, actually. Um, and I think online it is, is not the central part of that question. <laughs> I don't know. I think it, I, I, I think it's something about people and what people want, and I think it's how you. It's kind of what you were saying about how you how you work out how to live and how you want to live and how you share the workloads and all the rest of it. And I'm not convinced that that's particularly to do with online. I think I think that that people and possibly predominantly women will find that it could enable them to free up more time. That there might be ways of them getting stuff out there, finding like-minded people, finding collaborators, finding support networks and groups by doing that. And I think in general women feel that they they want to take part in those they want they want that kind of network to support what they do. And in and this is being terribly generalistic, but in general it, I, I sense that there are more women that want to do that than men. My experience is women coming coming to me saying, can we get this together? I need support. I want this kind of thing addressed. So it's, it is like they're trying to redress the balance. I, don't, I, I kind of don't think we should get... There's something about living and life and balance and relationships going on here as well as just online stuff. Hi, um, I'm a PhD student in my final year and I've wanted to blog, but what do I want to blog for? That's really what I want to know what I want to blog for. I feel like I want to blog, I have this urgency to blog, <laughs> but I really like the idea of becoming part of a, a group of bloggers, mm. but what I feel is important, especially in research science, is to have a page dedicated to your lab from which people from the lab can do guest blogs. And of course, that reinforces the area of field research that you do. And so that promotes your area of science, which is very, very important and is a huge part of science research. Um, so if you're not part of science research, why do you blog? And I think there's a distinction between different types of bloggers. You have the independent blogger who's just doing it as a Oh, like a deleton, so they really enjoy the field, they're not necessarily qualified in the field, but they really, really enjoy it. And then you've got the professionals who um, probably do it as um, dissemination, want to tell the truth as a writer, and, and then you have research scientists like myself who want to blog, don't know where to blog, how to blog, or even if it's worth blogging. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess this brings us on to the ultimate question is if we want to get online, how do we do it? How do we improve our visibility online? How do we get those blogs? Where do we blog? How does it all start? Mm. And you guys are the experts. Can I just say, to your, to your, to your, if you've got this need to blog, then you would just do it. You wouldn't need to be asking this question. You sound a bit like me when I'm doing revision and like I make timetables instead of actually doing revision because I'm categorizing things and everything. And there's nothing to be afraid of. And there's so many people in this room who just start to blog by themselves. And then they work out over the course of a year why it is they do it. They don't necessarily know from the beginning. 
don't feel like you have to have that reason now. Just do it, see what works. You might be the end up hating writing about science, you want to write about other stuff as well. And then things develop from there, and you find that maybe you like journalism, maybe you like other things. Maybe a young can tell you why you can start writing. <laughs> he seems to want to speak. That's rare. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was going to ask a question, so if you actually wanted to continue answering that. No, no, I'm finished. I'm finished. But maybe, maybe you can address the latest question. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question about, um, about self-promotion, because uh, Athene's written about this, and various panelists have alluded to this. Um, just from experience, uh, it, I suspect that men are more active about promoting their own work than women are online. Uh, certainly the, the people I know who've done things like approach me about being on panels that I've organized have largely been men. People who've approached me about uh, looking at or tweeting things that they've written and are proud of have largely been men. Um, and usually when I say this, there will be at least a couple of women in the audience who say, wow, really? Is that even a thing? Um, so I think there's two ways of looking at it. One is that um, you could say, in order to raise your visibility online, you do need to self-promote. And I do, do kind of believe that because there's a lot of noise out there and to rise above it and to make yourself seen and read, you do need to shout about what you are doing, especially if you're a writer, perhaps if you're a scientist as well. Um, so if one gender is uh, systematically not promoting itself, then that will lead to bias and maybe it should. But the other way of looking at it is that saying that is basically asking to women to compete in a very, in quite a traditionally masculine way. And is that really what we want to do to address um, gender biases here? Uh, in, in a perfectly meritocratic world, no one would need to self right? You, everyone would just, you know, be be promoted according to the quality of the work they do. But then I think in in this world, that is that is the situation where we find ourselves in, where self promotion is incredibly important. So um, I, I just wanted to get the panel's views on that tension between um, saying that self promotion is really necessary and also saying that uh, the people who are one shouldn't have to require everyone to be incredibly self-promoting in order to succeed. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, again, away from the online world, I think it is absolutely clear that women are less likely to self-promote. And I know you do a lot of work to promote the women when they don't want to do it themselves. I think it is important. I mean, when I talk to, to young women, again, nothing to do with online, I tend to say you have to be true to yourself. And I don't think you're going to make women who have been brought up thinking that, that it's you know not nice for girls to play like that, I don't think you're going to change them. But you can, all of us can do something to change the, the world we move in in the online sense of trying to support those women who are sort of making those tentative steps and getting out there. So I think it's a bit of both. Those women who are willing to self-promote no doubt will and will say to you, please retweet my tweet. Um, and and you may well pick up some of the others and you know we can all to some extent support each other so that when i mean maybe women feel more comfortable asking other women to to draw attention to their work i don't know but we should be conscious of it but i don't think you're going to change what is essentially a societal factor so, so can you point out that self-promotion is the only aim of being online because you can talk for a weird thing discussing about mastery. You could also talk about things that uh, science doesn't talk much, such as pain, and how it works, and some of the difficulties that you have experienced. And sometimes just to know uh, an environment that you're getting in as a PhD student, as a young master, and trying to know what are the concerns and how you can surround them is uh, sharing information. And, and uh, no, there, there, there's a nice question about what niche are uh, underrepresented currently in government. I think it, co it comes back to what, what you said in the first place, is you, you feel that you want to blog, but you're not quite sure about what it should be or why you're, why you're doing it. I think it's about... Sorry? Right. Right. 
Right. Yeah, whether you're commentating, whether you're redressing a balance, whether you're promoting the work of your team or, or whatever it is, yeah. But I think um, there was this uh, female blogger from the States called Female Science Professor who was nominated for some mentoring prize because of what she wrote online, to come back to your point. Mm. And I think online mentoring is fine, but it, if no one reads your blog, you're not helping people. So you do need that self-promotion. You need, you need, you, well, you need a readership. It's not so much a niche. You need a readership, and you need it to be the readership that will benefit from reading what you write. And I think it's getting to that point that it is quite challenging and without a bit of self-promotion. Mm. So one of the questions we were, we were thinking of asking all of you is that if you have a top three of um, what every woman in science should do right now, no. engaging online, what should they do? What are the three things that are important for every full of for their so CV, well, I mean, there's a difference from their CV from no, from their per, from their visibility. What, what, you, what you would you recommend? Is it writing a blog? Is it being on Twitter? Is it uh, being making sure you have your research gates a profile up and running? What, what should it be? I don't think I know what it should be. I I I really don't. I feel I'm just too new into this, and I'm not using it as a research scientist, but I'm sure, I don't know whether it's that people would kind of find it useful to have a template to follow. I think already on, on the, the website there's some, there's some good links to this is what you can do, this is where you can go. I think it's all about the purpose and, and why you're doing it. You know, I've got, I've got my sort of pet favorite places that I go to and that are my favorite things that I read. So, you know, I think I would go to, you know, the UKRC, um, dot org and, and look at women in science and engineering wise I would go there into the research information network but those are just things that I've discovered and I'm sure if we have this conversation in 12 months time I'll have you know completely different views and everything will be completely different and that's the problem everything all the research you read if it's anything 2010 or 2011 it's already out of date so I, I'm, so, I'm, not, I'm not being glib I honestly just don't know the answer so I have a bit of a point and then I guess a bit of a question or maybe a question more for the room than just mm. the panel, which is that it strikes me that quite a lot of this conversation has been incredibly general about women as one big massive lump that are all the same and we are not all the same. We, are, we would never ever say, how would Twitter help men? <laughs> how does Twitter help people? How do people use these things? It's different. Mm. And I think what we ought to be talking about a bit more and maybe we can see this as a slightly longer project, is if people, and um, people in general, and women especially, especially because there is a, an issue, go away and think about a specific instance where potentially what they have done online has helped them, and they could, there's a document on, on, online, it would be good to have a, maybe some more case studies. So the, rather than doing some hand-wavy general discussion, we start, you know, there, there are, there is data out there, but there's probably not actually that much data out there. Maybe we should be looking a little bit more. And certainly, different people in different disciplines have completely different needs, expectations, and experiences. You know, I have certain people I know in the arts, humanities, and social sciences who just wouldn't be having this conversation because their world isn't like that. So, you know, you're quite right. I don't know whether this is a specific science thing or even branches of science or just the kind of woman you are, you know, at the end of the day. So. Great. So I, I guess what, what, what we're all concluding is that there are many different ways of engaging with online. And the, the media that you choose depends on your reasons. So there's lots of different reasons why you might go online and the type of person that you are. Um, but probably online, is, is, it's emerging as such a versatile tool that anyone should be able to find something out there that, that suits them. Who knows what's going to be the new form of communication over the internet in the next coming years. Um, I think we're drawing to a close. Um, but just to let you know that as part of this session, Natalie and I have been putting together uh, a toolkit resource um, of all the different ideas that we've collated through the tweets that people have been sending us, um, through our panelists' uh, suggestions, through the uh, blogs that we've been having out over the last few weeks. 
in, so all that information is in one place. Um, this is obviously needs to be an evolving document, um, but we'll be putting that on the spot on um, website so that everybody can access it. But we'd also like you to contact us, tell us your ideas, tell us what, what you think, how this resource, how this toolkit can be improved. Um, so do, you can tweet us, um, you can email us. Um, and we'll be following up this event with a Storyfy, um, which will be collating all the information that has been amassed through tweets, through blogs, etc., to do this event all in one place. So if you want to just kind of get a catch up of everything that's going on, you can go to that place. Um, so I, it remains for me to thank our three panelists, and um, particularly a lot for jumping at the last minute, um, and also to you guys for interacting in such an engaging way. So thank you.